el, el micrófono. David, your microphone. You can start now, David. please. El, el micrófono. No. Andrés, porfa, arranca tú, por favor. Listo, arranco yo. Bueno, bienvenidos a la decimoséptima versión de la Semana de la Comunicación, más sexto Festival Internacional Audiovisual, FIAFES de la Facultad de Comunicación de la Universidad de La Sabana. Iniciamos hoy con este Unisabana Ágora que corresponde al Departamento de Comunicación Audiovisual. Gracias por seguirnos en esta transmisión del evento. Los invitamos también a que nos sigan en nuestras redes, en Twitter, Facebook e Instagram, y que nos busquen también como USM Com Sabana. Comenzaré ahorita hablando en español y después vamos a pasar a inglés, que va a ser el, event, el, el idioma en el que se desarrollará el evento. El día de hoy tenemos la oportunidad de usar esta plataforma para hacer públicamente el lanzamiento de un convenio que nos alegra mucho tener con una institución de educación hermana tan prestigiosa como el New York Film Academy, por la que ya han pasado y seguro seguirán pasando muchos alumnos. Durante varios meses hemos trabajado desde las dos instituciones para llegar a un acuerdo pensando en los intereses de los estudiantes. Les agradezco principalmente su dedicación especial en esta labor de lograr este convenio a Jill Matos en New York Film Academy y Angélica Molinas, nuestra coordinadora de asuntos internacionales de la facultad. El convenio que tenemos el gusto de, de, de brindarles a partir de este año eh, le da la oportunidad a nuestros estudiantes de pregrado de iniciar estudios coterminales con el Máster de Film and Media Production del New York Film Academy. La idea es que el estudiante de la sabana pueda utilizar los créditos de su último semestre de clases del pregrado para comenzar el primer periodo del máster, homologando así los últimos requisitos académicos para continuar con el posgrado. Convenios como este le permiten a nuestros estudiantes ganar por un lado tiempo y por el otro beneficios económicos en las dos instituciones. Para los interesados en explorar esta opción, al final del evento estaremos invitando a otro evento que realizaremos en la primera semana de noviembre, en donde entraremos en las explicaciones de detalles y procedimientos específicos de, de, de cómo eh, adoptar este convenio de, de coterminalidad con New York Film Academy. De todas maneras, Angélica Molinas eh, y yo también estamos dispuestos para cualquier estudiante que quiera tener una asesoría personal y resolver dudas sobre cómo funciona el convenio. Bueno, entonces ahora sí, pasemos a inglés. Let's start our event. Today, we are pleased to have Jonathan Whitaker with us. Jonathan is a partner and founding member of Manning Hat, a New York-based production company with over 15 years of experience in the film industry, having produced direct and lensed short films, music videos, live concerts, commercials, TV shows, features, docs, and 3D specials, he is never one to shy away from a new challenge. Nissan, Sony Pictures, DirecTV, Gillette, Hyundai, and Sports Illustrated are just a few of his clients and collaborators. When he is not on the set or in an edit, you can usually find him at the head of a lecture hall, sharing his thoughts of the art of cinematography and director's craft. In addition to being a resident professor at the New York Film Academy, he is also uh, giving guest lectures all over the globe, as right now, virtually in Chia, Colombia. Jonathan, welcome to Universidad de la Sabana. Thanks for accepting the invitation and for being here with us today, sharing your, sharing your knowledge and your experience with us means a lot to us. Thank you, Jonathan, and welcome again. Andres, uh, thank you for thank you for having me, and thank you to La Sabana uh, overall for uh, inviting the New York Film Academy to join you um, during this event. And we're very excited for our partnership, our collaboration, and we look forward to uh, many wonderful years of uh, educating the storytellers of tomorrow. Um, it's a very oh, exciting, sure. very exciting for us. Um, so. Good morning to everybody. Uh, it's uh, to understand it. It's still earlier for you than it is for me. Um, but as Andre said, my name is Jonathan Whitaker. I am uh, a, a co-chair of filmmaking at the New York campus for the New York Film Academy. Uh, additionally, like all of our faculty 
and most of our staff, I'm also a working professional. And uh, these days I work, I realized that my bio is a little bit outdated. I, I wish it were just 15 years that I were working because then I would be six years younger. Uh, but uh, these days I work as a director and a producer and sometimes still work as a cinematographer. But I, I, I came up in the film industry, mainly in New York, uh, in the G and E departments, grip and electric. And I was an electrician for many years and worked my way up to a gaffer and then a cinematographer. And it was probably about seven years into my career that I got my first break to actually direct something, which is what I'd always wanted to do. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. Just uh, the past then, I guess that would be, that then would be uh, 14 years of experience as a director. And so I'd like to share with you all today, um, some of the, some of what I learned through the years, uh, some of it hard earned through making mistakes and learning what didn't work. Sometimes that's the, the best lesson for us. And some of it just through my mentors and uh, some of my collaborators. So. Again, I'm going to tell you a little bit about like what 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 a director needs to know and how to effectively communicate. Um, what I would love for at the end of this is that we have the chance to have a really robust Q and A. Um, I think it's always interesting to hear your questions and be able to answer them directly. So, uh, time permitting, we will we will do that today. But again, um, thank you all. Excited to be here. I'm going to try to keep my New York pace. Uh, a little bit slower than I normally would speak um, and try to articulate everything. But if I do get excited, hopefully that just uh, shows you how excited I am about filmmaking in general. So I'm going to jump into my screen share and um, and uh, go through the, my presentation. So we are the New York Film Academy, which, which of course you know. Um, and then today, what again, what I really want to talk about is uh, what a director needs to know. Um, and at first, I kind of start with like, well, who does a director direct, right? I mean, we, we all understand that term director, or we think we do. Uh, anyone who has directed any piece of content, of course, then you know what the job entails. Uh, but I think a lot of people, <clears throat> a lot of people have this idea of what a director is before they even get into it, before they do it. And I think in their mind, at least in my mind, it was that the director was kind of like a dictator. It was the person who comes on the set and tells everyone what to do, right? Do it this way, act this way, shoot it this way, light it this way, uh, cut it that way, distribute it that way. Uh, and that's not entirely true. Of course, there are directors like that, uh, but I would argue those are not the most effective directors. Ultimately, who we are as directors are communicators. That's our job. Our job is to take a story, to break it down, to communicate that um, via direction, right? So then, so then who do we direct? Well, we direct our crew. The crew are all the technical artists who come to work on your film, right? And this is done mainly in pre-production, right? You meet with your department heads, you meet with your cinematographer, your production designer, your sound recordist. Uh, of course, you meet with your AD and your production manager and producer, but the main creative people who come to work on your set, um, that is the crew. And the best way to communicate to them is through visual references and oral references. So what does the film look like? What does it sound like? Uh, what does the commercial look like or sound like? Um, but you also wanna to communicate to what is the central premise, right? What is the story about? What are, what, what are we setting out to prove? Why are we telling this story? Uh, any, you know, any good film, any story that really resonates with an audience has a very strong through line or sometimes called the spine. Right. So, again, if we can distill it down, you know, this 60 pages, this 90 pages, 120 pages, if we can distill that down to a single sentence. Uh, that's what we need to do. And then we need to share that sentence with our crew so they understand, OK, what is this all about? And if we think about, you know, if I think of a film like, you know, as film students, I'm sure you've heard of a film called Citizen Kane, obviously one of the most iconic films of all time. Uh, Citizen Kane's about a lot of things, of course, you know, explores many different themes, but at its heart, at its spine, it, I could say that the sentence would be external splendor does not provide happiness, right? So no matter how much money you acquire, that does not necessarily bring happiness into your life. And Orson Welles, you know, knowing that that was the, the premise of the story, communicated that to everybody. And you see that reflected in everything about the film. Greg Toland's cinematography in that film, if you think about it, uh, the film is famous for using wide lenses and deep, deep depths of field. So you could see everything is in crisp, clear focus from the very foreground to all the way to the background. And that reflects the story, 
right? We have these locations, these these massive mansions. Of course, when 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 Charles Kane gets more rich, he lives in these big opulent estates, and you can see, and they look so large, but they feel empty. And so the location, the production design, the cinematography, the lighting all reflects the central premise. And so that is your job to do in pre-production, to inspire your crew, and then to give them the autonomy to go out and make decisions on their own. And your, your job is not to micromanage them. Your job is not to call every single shot. Your job is to share your vision, to share the premise of the story, and to inspire them inspire them as artists that they are to go out and to work to the best of their ability. And we don't do that by micromanaging. We do do that though, however, by taking suggestions and knowing when to say yes to a suggestion and when to say no, when it doesn't work for the story. But you have to be open to that. And that's what creates a better set. I mean, I think you've all had this experience, right? You've been part of a creative project, whether it's creating visual content or not, you've been part of uh, group work. And, you know, when you bring something to the table and you say, okay, hey, why don't we try this? And you're excited for your idea. And then whoever is in charge of that committee, that group, they say, no, we're not going to do that. And then maybe another idea pops up a little bit later. You're like, okay, okay, great, great. Why don't we do this? Right? And then the group goes, nah, yeah, we're not doing that. Right? Eventually what happens? You stop making suggestions and you stop caring about the project. And that's not the kind of crew that you want to, to have working for you. You want everyone to care about your project. You want everyone to give suggestions at the right time, of course, right? Not in the middle of a take, you know, but in between takes or over lunch, in the morning meeting or at the end of the day. But still, you want people engaged. You want people making suggestions. You want people making choices. You want people believing that a piece of this film is theirs. Because if the crew feels like that they are making creative choices, they feel like their voice is heard. They feel like some of this film is theirs and they'll care about it much more. It's not just then about showing up and getting a paycheck. It's about creating content that they love and they care about. And again, that's going to create a better project, better project for you. And ultimately, it's going to be a more successful film. So again, I want to make clear that we're not just, you know, the, the, you know, sitting there as king of the castle, telling people, do this, do that, do this, don't do that. Uh, we're inspiring them to make creative choices. Who else is a director direct? Well, the cast. The actors that come to embody your characters, that's the people the audience comes to see. That's the, those are the people the audience get their emotional cues from. Right? The, that, that's where you know, the characters act as surrogate for the audience, and the audience kind of lives the life uh, through the characters. And so, of course, it's you know, the utmost importance. And I, I, have a, uh, I like to believe, I don't know if it's my saying or not, I've said it so many times, I'm not sure if someone else said it or I co-opted it, but um, there's no such thing as bad acting. There's really only bad directing. And then sometimes my students will say, yeah, but what if the actor just really isn't good, right? What if the actor just is incapable? Well, then you know what? It was bad casting. So it still comes back to you. So ultimately, you as the director are as responsible for the performance as the actors are and i really want you to believe that right there's no scapegoating there's no like oh well the actor is not getting this so they're not doing this right you know that you can probably trace that back to bad directing and the number one responsibility during shooting and so when do we direct actors so i'll take a step back well we direct actors during rehearsal and pre-production hopefully you have time for that uh, you have budget for that. Some, that's not always the case. Uh, even on professional projects, we don't always have time for rehearsal. Ideally, you do, right? You get to rehearse every scene for at least an hour. Every individual scene, you get to rehearse for an hour. Um, that's not always the case. Some days, you know, an actor's showing up on the day of shooting, but still you would want to rehearse it with them right before the take. And so you direct them, obviously, in rehearsal. We also direct them during the shooting. And that's your number one job. As a director, that is your number one responsibility during the day of shooting, right? You have a cinematographer who's there, who's looking after the image, right? The cinematographer is responsible for everything that goes into the look uh, of the film that is not part of the set. So everything that goes into camera and lighting, the cinematographer, the DOP, the DP, she's responsible for that. Um, you have a production designer. Production designer, of course, is responsible for everything else you see on set, everything from hair and makeup to wardrobe to the to the to the props to the to the set decoration. Right. Uh, and, and he or she is responsible for that. You have a sound technician who's responsible for recording the sound elements that you've deemed necessary for that, for that film.
uh, sorry about that. Hope you all didn't hear that. Um, you have an AD who's responsible for keeping you on schedule, you know, making sure that you're getting the shots that you designed in your shot list, right? So in other words, you have a lot of other people who are, who, who are responsible for all the other stuff that goes into the visual language that is cinema, uh, the production side of it and the artistic side of it. But there's no one who is there who's responsible for the performance but you. So that is your job. You go into that day knowing that you are going to work with the actors, that you are going to be there to protect the integrity of the performance, that you're going to be giving thoughtful notes, that you're going to be inspiring them, that you're going to be giving them the, the permission to fail. That can be a very powerful tool, just letting them know it's okay if they don't get it right the first time. Uh, you're, again, your job is to be there for them. And I, I'll make one recommendation. I mean, of course, we can talk about directing actors for days, months, years, right? It's something that I've been, been practicing all of my professional career, and I still there's still a lot that I need to know about it. Uh, but I guess a few pieces of advice. One of them is that if you're not yet familiar with the language of acting, if you're not yet familiar with what goes into a performance, try it, right? Even if you have no intention of ever being an actor, put yourself in front of the camera. So this way you can empathize with what it's like to be in front of the camera. And you, you understand what better directing and bad, good directing and bad directing would be. Uh, get involved with theater. Understand the craft. Uh, immerse yourself in the different schools of acting, right? No two actors are the same. I like to think they're kind of like snowflakes, right? Everyone's different. Uh, and they all can be a bit fragile. Um, so learn about the different schools of acting and, and, and try acting your, yourself. Uh, but my other recommendation would be more of a practical one on set. Um, I think that if you get as close to you can, as close as you can to the performance without obviously being in the shot and not looking at a monitor, not directing from a monitor, not looking through a camera, but being there and focusing solely on the performance, you'll know when there's a false note. You'll know when the actor isn't present. You'll know when the actor is not acting and reacting and they're just saying the lines because you'll feel that, right? You'll be sitting there watching the performance and, 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 you know, a red flag will go off. You'll start thinking about something else or you won't be captivated. And if you're not captivated by the performance when you're watching it there live, do you think the audience is going to be? Probably not. So what I do is I like to watch the performance and uh, then when I see what I believe to be a good take. When I, see, when I see what I believe to be a good performance, obviously then I call cut, and then I go look at the monitor. And then I say, show me playback. Let me make sure all of the other elements, because I know the performance was good. It resonated with me. That was great, the actors nailed it. Uh, but then I go back and look at the monitor, and then I'll look and make sure all the other elements that make up the visual language of cinema are in place, that the, that the focus was right, that the, the, the framing was right, uh, that the exposure looked great, all the things that I know that are very important. Um, and then also listen to it too, to make sure the sound is good. And then once, I, once I've approved that, then we move on to the next camera setup. So I'll watch rehearsal on a monitor. Then we go for a live take, I'll watch just the actors, and then I'll go back to the monitor. Again, really for me, it's, the reason why I do that is twofold. One, the actors feel your presence. If you're way back in Video Village, you know, hidden behind four by four floppies and solids, the actors, they, they, they don't, you know, of course they know you're on set, but they don't feel that you're really there. And you are their audience, right? Everything else is the mechanical thing and all these crew members who are turned, who are, who are told to turn their backs and not to break their concentration. But if, if, if you are there and you're focused on the performance, they know that, they feel that, and that gives them more confidence when they, when they perform a take. So there's that side of it. But also, if we're looking at a monitor, if we're looking at, you know, the camera movement and maybe a, a rack focus or, you know, a lighting gag or whatever it is, our brain is, is really now, it's going to be fractured. We're going to be thinking about many different things. And, um, you know, whereas multitasking might be a good skill set in some professions, I would argue it's not so in this one. If you can focus solely on one thing, you'll do that one thing better. So. You know, all those other things are important, of course. That's why I will watch a rehearsal for camera, sign off on it, watch the performance once I like it, look at the playback, and then move on to the next one. Anyway, um, yeah, we could talk about directing actors for, uh, for, for all day, for the rest of the time. 
but what I want to get to is the, the third group of, uh, of people, the third cohort that we direct, and that is the audience. And this is something that we have to keep in mind at every stage of production, from pre to production to post-production. And what do I mean by that? I mean, what are we actually saying? What are we communicating to the audience? And I ask myself when I'm, when I'm designing my shots, when I'm thinking about uh, how am I going to take the written word and put it into the visual language that is cinema, I ask myself really two fundamental questions. Um, what does the audience need to know? Right? At this moment, right now, in this scene, in order to understand the story, um, what does the audience need to know? What information do I need to give them? And then I say, okay, how do I want them to feel about what they now know? And, you know, what do they need to know and how do I want them to feel? And the answers to those questions then become the guiding force for all of the choices I make when it comes again to the visual language that is cinema. Where am I placing the camera? What is the shot size? Uh, what does the lighting look like, right? What is the contrast ratio? What color palette are we dealing with? Um, how should the actor act? You know, again, what information am I giving them and how do I want them to feel? And this happens through all phases of production. So with that in mind, I'd like to, to dive a little bit deeper into then what do I mean by the language of cinema? Well, I think we all know this, right? We all consume copious amounts of content these days, whether it's online, streaming platforms, theaters, traditional broadcast, phones. Uh, and so we're all, we're all actually pretty well versed in this language. We may not know it, we may not know the grammar behind it and the rules, but we know the language. We know the language of which I speak. Cinema is a visual language, right? And um, if a director is doing her job, you should be able to understand a story without having the sound on. And I think we, we, we've all had this experience, whether it's on a plane or we're in a public space and there's a TV on. And, you know, you, you, before you know it, you get engrossed in this story and you're kind of watching it, but you can't hear it. Right. You're on a plane. You're looking over at someone else's mo monitor in front of them. And next, you know, 10 minutes goes by and you're like, oh, this is a great film. But you, you don't know what they're saying. Right. And it doesn't matter uh, because something about the, the design of the shot, something about, you know, what is happening on the screen is captivating. That's the language of cinema. Right. The sound design and all that other stuff, that's just, you know, additional information. Uh, but if, if you're well versed in it, you can communicate purely visually. And, um, you know, when I think of language, right, I think of, uh, try to think of continuing the analogy, right? We, we as human beings, we, we use words, right, to communicate uh, messages to get what we want, whether it's the written word or the spoken word. Um, you know, we use words, right? That's the smallest increment of things that we do. In, in for the filmmaker, for the director, the word is really the shot, right? And so technically during production, the shot is everything from when a director calls action to when a director calls cut. Obviously then in post-production that gets cut up and that shot might get reduced uh, to, to a much smaller increment. Um, but so what is the end shot or the shot on set? Uh, doesn't matter, That that is what I consider equal to the word. And hopefully, as, uh, as conscious human beings, we're choosing our words carefully. Uh, we're thinking about what is the intended consequence of using this word. Um, as I'm sitting here trying to think of the right words, right? I'm trying to think of the right thing to say in this moment. That's what I do when I'm, I'm also directing a film. And there are many considerations that go into the design of the shot. Again, just like there are many considerations that go into the choice of the word. And so these are just some of the considerations. Now, I will say that when I'm reading a script, uh, of course, I'm seeing it in my mind's eye. This is something we all do, whether we're reading a script, we're reading a novel, you know, when we're reading the written word, we, we see it in our mind. And so that, that is a good indication of what it should look like. That's the director's intuition. And so when I'm reading a script, of course, I'm jotting down notes in the margins of the script as to what, what does it look like, right? What does it feel like? What am I seeing? What do I think uh, the audience wants to see? And at this point, I'm acting like the audience. And I'm thinking about what do I want to see, right? What would be interesting to me in this setting to see? What information do I want? And so that, those become, you know, my very rough shot list. But then I have to go back and really give it careful consideration. And so when I'm designing my shots. These are the considerations. Um, what is the shot size? And again, this is kind of filmmaking 101. Anyone who knows anything about filmmaking, you know shot size. These are universal. Doesn't matter where you are in the world. These are the agreed upon six shot sizes. There are no more, no less. 
There might be variations of them, so you might know them by different names, but there are six shot sizes, right? We have an extreme wide shot. That would be, you know, where the character is very, very tiny in, 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 in reference to the overall frame, right? This is where the emphasis is put on location. So very far back, bird's eye view, uh, maybe we see just the characters as a small detail in the overall landscape. Then you have a wider full shot, wider full shots from head to toe, right? We can see the full body, the body language. Now it's about a 50-50 location character. They're, they're about tantamount uh, importance. Medium shot, medium shot is typically from the waist to the top of the head. Um, sometimes we drop that frame down a little bit lower and we cut that off at the middle of the thigh, uh, sometimes called the American or the Western shot. Because, you know, the American Westerns, they had to go for their guns in their holsters and you need to see them pulling out the gun. So they dropped the frame a little bit lower. Then you have a medium close-up. That's probably what I'm in right now. Medium close-up is from the chest to the top of the head. Then we got a close-up, right? Close-up is from the top of the shoulders to the top of the head. Right now we're moving into the internal landscape of the character. Now we're less importance on the actual physical landscape, more about what the character is going through, what they're thinking, what they're reacting to. And then extreme close-up, small detail, like the eye or the lips or something that we see really large in the frame. So those I think we're all familiar with, right? And those answer the question, what does the audience need to know? Because that's what you're showing them. Are we showing them the entire landscape? Are we showing them the entire geography as an establishing shot? So the audience now knows all of the important elements that are in the frame. Or are we starting a scene, maybe an extreme close-up, now posing a question in the mind of the audience, withholding information. So what's in what, what's in white on my screen here? That is, that for me answers the question about what does the audience need to know. The what's in red is something called proxemics theory, and proxemics theory is really just a fancy term, if we can say it's fancy, um, for the for the human phenomenon that um, is that we as humans we keep distance based on relations based on relationships so proxemics proximity right so we we know this right we keep certain distance based on relationship and some of this is cultural some cultures you know being near to someone is not uh, as um, intimate as it may be in other cultures uh, but for the most part you know we all have the same kind of barriers and so the, to illustrate this point think back of the last time you were on a really crowded bus or a packed elevator I bet you didn't look everybody in the eye. I bet you didn't look around at everybody and say, you know, stare at them in the face because you didn't know them and that would be weird. And they are sharing your intimate space, but you do not know them intimately. And so you don't want to acknowledge their presence. That's proxemics theory. Well, so if in life we maintain distance, we keep distance based on relationship, pre-existing relationship or lack thereof, in film it's the reverse. We kind of flip it we build relationship based on perceived distance. So in other words, if I want the audience to feel a certain way about a character, I will put them in, you know, if that certain way is I want them to empathize and I want them to feel as if they know this character very well, I will use, I put that character in medium close-ups and close-ups because now the audience is going to start to feel, oh, okay, I know this person. I know this person. This person is someone with my friend. It's someone that's my family member. And they will start to care for that person. So again, keep that in mind. What do I want them to know? How do I want them to feel about what, what they're now seeing? That's just one of the considerations, right? Um, another one is the angle of the camera in relation to the character's eye line. And, you know, Alexander McKendrick, who, who was a, a famous filmmaker, his, his most famous film was The Sweet Smell of Success, but he was also a, maybe even a more famous film professor at uh, Cal Arts. He was one of the ones that founded one of the first film making programs in the world. Um, when he was educating his directors, you know, he gave a little analogy and I think it really resonated with me. And so hopefully it'll resonate with you. And um, he was saying that, you know, he was really outlining the difference between a theater director and a film director. And he was saying, you know, there's a lot of similarities, right? We're dealing with acting. We're dealing with story and acting and acting beats and story beats. We're dealing with blocking and movement. Uh, both sides were dealing with light. Um, but one of the main differences between the director for the theater and a director for the screen is that for the stage, in almost all of theater, the audience is watching from a fixed position. 
right? You, they they take their seat and they watch this whole this whole this whole play play out, this whole story play out. Um, but for the screen, as a director, it's like you get to pick up that chair. It's like you get to 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 grab the audience by the hand and say, "Hey, look at it from this angle. Check out this story from over here." Watch what this character is doing from over here, or come spend time with this character. And that's what we're doing when we're placing the camera. We're placing the audience. And again, part of that is what do you want them to see? But part of that is also how do you want them to feel? And so simply just where you place the camera in relation to a character's eye line will change the way they feel about the scene, will change the way they feel about that, that character and their relationship to that character. And to give an example of that, what do I mean by eye line? Well, eye line, of course, right now my eye line is directly at the camera. I'm looking at my camera. So my eye line is here. And you can choose to make that to make that your, your placement if you want to break the fourth wall and confront the audience and kind of get them out of that voyeurship. But you can put that anywhere you want, right? And it's going to feel completely different. And to, to give you uh, an example of what I mean, let's just say that um, – Andres in, introduced me and I came on and th this was me, right? I came on to your screens, wherever you may be. And I said, you know, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jonathan Whitaker. Uh, I'm from the New York Film Academy. We're going to talk about directing today. Doesn't that feel different? Right? How engaged do you feel with me? Do you feel like I'm speaking to you? Probably not. It's a reason why we try to make eye contact when we're doing public speaking. It's a reason why your professors will stand up the front and, you know, try to make sure everyone is engaged. And it's the reason why when the camera comes around closer to zero degrees that you feel more engaged with the story. You feel a deeper connection to the, to the character as opposed to being at 90 degrees and being removed and feeling objective. So where are we placing that camera in relation to their eye line? Another consideration is, okay, now I know the shot size. Um, I know where I want to place the camera. What, what about the height of that camera? Where do I place the height of that camera in relation to the character's eyes? Right, because just the subtle difference, right? We can do there's there's three there's three placements and there's variations within that, but there's eye level, pretty much eye level here, right? You can go uh, above eye level if we go up in here, right? Or you can go below eye level. I try to come up there and I can't quite stand up and get into the frame, but anyway, you get the idea. Um, just that alone is going to change the way the audience feels about the character and feels about their stature in the story or their sense of dominance or lack thereof within the given context of a scene. Um, that is also why your professors, for the most part, stand up when they're teaching and they ask you to sit down. Because if we have to physically look up to somebody, we start to psychologically look up to somebody. It's the reason why the majority of, you know, of, of world leaders, uh, whether it be in business or, or, or government, are over six feet tall. I don't think it's because tall people are better leaders. I like to not think that's so. I mean, you can't tell because I'm sitting down, but I'm pretty short. Um, so, you know, but again, it's just, it, it's just, it's true, right? Physically, if we look up to someone or look down to someone, we start to feel that way about them as a person. And so I'm going to quickly go through the rest of the considerations. Then as promised, I, I did want to leave some time for, uh, for some Q and A. So let's go over some other considerations then uh, about the shot. Um, it's a little bit wonky the screen, but focal length. This is a choice a director makes when they're doing the shot list. What is the lens that you're using, right? Focal length is a, is a technical term. Uh, simply means the distance from the optical center of a lens to the film plane or to the sensor in the camera. Uh, but based on that focal length and the size of the format you're shooting, the lens fits in the one of three main categories, wide angle, normal, or telephoto. And understanding as a director, how those different lenses render space differently and how the audience might then react to that um, is important, right? A wide, a wide angle lens exaggerates distance on the Z axis. It gives you a wider angle of view, it gives you a deeper depth of field. A normal lens is the most human-like and a telephoto of course is the opposite of wide angle. It compresses space on the Z axis. It gives you a more narrow angle of view and therefore field of view. And um, it typically has a shallower depth of field. Right. So understanding how are we using the lenses to maybe work as a visual metaphor for what the characters are going through. And to give an example of this, I think of uh, many films. Well, one film is um, Raging Bull by Martin Scorsese. And when um, Jake LaMotta, Robert De Niro's character, uh, when he was, you know, there's some very highly stylized scenes in that, specifically the fight sequences. 
And when Jake LaMotta, the character, was winning a fight, um, Scorsese would oftentimes use a wide-angle lens to exaggerate the size of the ring. And in, it, for him, that communicated to the audience that Jake LaMotta was king of this big territory. And when he was losing a fight, or if he had gotten himself into trouble and had to throw a fight, he oftentimes would shrink the ring through telephoto lenses. And then here it felt like, given the sense of Jake LaMotta, how he felt, the character felt trapped. The character felt like they were stuck in the ring and they had to do what they had to do, but they weren't, they weren't you know, happy about it. So again, just using lenses to help to tell your story. Camera movement. Does the camera move in this shot? If it does move, first of all, why does it move? And the answer should never be because it looks cool or it adds production value. Uh, it should always be because the story necessitates a camera movement. Because I want to emphasize uh, uh, what, what a character is doing or I want to give importance to a character or I want to communicate the loss of control or I want to communicate the sense of ethereal feeling or whatever it is. There, it should always be rooted in the story, right? All of your decisions are, are, are based on the story and what's happening. Um, but how does the camera move then? There's many ways to move it. Blocking and staging of the actors, the physical distance between them can, can communicate relationship. The distance between the actors and the lens can communicate dominance and you know with their importance within the story. And then composition, all of the elements in the frame. So they, again, these are the considerations, right? Once I figure out the blocking, you know, I, then then I think, okay, how am I going to compose that? Uh, understanding that you know, how the audience reads a frame, how we as humans uh, interpret images, understanding that the right-hand side of a frame is more important than the left-hand side of the frame, understanding the top of the frame is more important than the bottom of the frame. When I say more important, when we scan a frame, when we, when we look at an image, our eyes come to rest on the right-hand side of a frame. And so therefore that, whatever lives there in the frame, on the subconscious level is already more important to us. And so if we want to establish dominance or if we want to just emphasize one character or one element over another. And if you don't believe me, think about the majority of talk shows. I can't say I'm well-versed in Colombian talk shows, but uh, maybe you've seen some U.S. talk shows. And um, where does the host sit? It's always on the right. Or it's almost always on the right, right? And that's by design, even though the guest might be uh, some, you know, a famous actor or somebody really important in business or politics, the guest sits on the left and the host sits on the right because they know that the right-hand side is more important. Anyway, I kind of went through some of those quick, but I did want to leave some time for some Q&A. Um, you know, hopefully there's some things in there that you can take and think about next time that you go out and communicate. But again, what I want to emphasize, and I know I sound redundant, but I think it's important, is that as a director, we're communicators. And it's utterly important how you communicate. Um, it's our job to take this story and to break it down and to put it into the visual language. It's our job to make sure that all of our crew, that they know what the story is about, that they know what is the vision for this story. It's important that they know that their feedback is important. And it's important that the actors know that you're there to protect the integrity of the performance. And of course, it's important that we're thinking about what does the audience need to know and how they should feel throughout every phase of production. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now and um, I believe uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi again, Jonathan. How are you? Great, great presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, let's move ahead and let the audience uh, make a couple of questions. I think we have enough time for that. So uh, let me invite the, the audience. Uh, to use this chat uh, for make some questions for Jonathan. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hopefully, you're all, yeah. Hopefully you're all still there. Well, I uh, don't see questions in chat. Eh, para la gente que está en la audiencia, si quiere chat eh, las preguntas, creo que por tiempo vamos a alcanzar a responder una o dos, dependiendo de qué tan rápido fluya. Ok. Okay. 
Andres, Andres, we got one in the in the screen. So if you want oh. me to to read Please it. Please go ahead. Read. Okay. So Valentina Sanchez, Jonathan is saying this, is asking this. Sometimes directors give deep messages through hidden actions or things we can see at first sight. Can you give us a tip to make this as a director? Yeah, so I, thank, th thank you for the, for the question. Um, as I understand it, what you're saying is that sometimes the directors hide these little things uh, within the frame or within the, the sound design that on, on the surface is not obvious to the audience. Um, and uh, sometimes the audience doesn't even get it at all. I would say that that can be very effective storytelling. It, it can be a fun um, technique to use. And maybe the audience understands it maybe on the subliminal level or subconscious level, but they're not fully cognizant of it. Um, I would say that, you know, I don't know if I can give you a, a direct example from my work in particular, but I would say some considerations that go into that would be um, one of the first things we want to think about. So I asked the question, you know, what does the audience need to know? And, you know, when you're asking yourself that, um, really think about what do they absolutely have to know? Because it is always better to withhold information than it is to give more than is necessary. So, you know, it's better to err on the side of not explaining something, not giving them all the information and posing a question in the mind of the audience. And that's not exactly what the question that you asked. I know, I know that, but I did want to say that. Um, but then, you know, I guess the point of me bringing that up is that if you are, quote unquote, hiding a message and you're not sure if the audience is going to understand it, make sure that that piece of information is not something that they absolutely have to know in order to understand the story as it unfolds. So it might be additional information. It might be additional color or a, again, a hidden message for them to pick up on that is not integral to them understanding the plot because you don't want to, you don't want to outright confuse them for confusion's sake. You do want them to be engaged and you do want them thinking about what's going to happen next. Uh, how did that happen? Or, you know, you, you do want to have surprises and things of that, that nature, but you don't want outright confusion uh, because no one enjoys that. You know, so, I mean, I don't know. If maybe you can tell me otherwise, but I know when I go to a film and if I leave, then I go, you know, I didn't know what the hell that was about. I, I That's not a good experience for me. Um, having me think about something, having me question something, having me question my understanding, my interpretation, my point of view of the story of the world. Now, that is good. Um, and so if you're doing it for that purpose, then I'd say go for it. Um, again, I'm not sure I answered your question directly because I wasn't sure if it was like, do you, do you want an example of how one might do that? Um, if that's the case, then, you know, sometimes it's something that's in the in, in within a prop or it's within the, you know, the, the, the set, something that, you know, means something, some type of reference or some type of item or symbol, right? Symbolisms can be important. Um, there's something called isomorphic correspondence and isomorphic correspondence simply says that we derive meaning from images. And so certain images or certain items that are in an image will evoke emotions in us based on our own memories. So when you see like a knife on the screen, right, that automatically makes us feel uh, on edge, ill at ease because a knife represents danger. We've all seen someone cut or have been cut by a knife at some point in our life. Um, accidentally i hope uh so you know things like that you can think about things like that you can plant within the image um you know i, I was referencing scorsese's film uh you know raging bull and he was he did be a sound design right through sound design you know there were like lion roars baked into it mixed into it and you know that represented the way that the character felt so there can be hitting messages with with, with within that and that can be effective Jonathan, thank you um, for the audience. Uh, sorry, we don't have any more time to do the the, the other questions. Only if you they can do it like very, very fast. Maybe Jonathan, we can. <laughs> you, you will check on, on the shop. It is exploding okay, right we, now. We got, we got one. One more, but a quick quick one answer, okay. Up, please. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So okay, I'll try. you guys now know that brevity is not my forte, <laughs> but I'll try. Okay, Jonathan, so in your experience, how you develop your own acting direction method? That is one of the questions. 
Yes. Uh, that's not an easy one answer, but okay. Um, experience, uh, speaking to actors, right? Seeing what works, what doesn't work, asking them, right? Letting my ego go and just saying, you know, maybe that was bad direction. What do you need from me? Right. But really it all goes back to know the story better than anyone else. Know what the character wants in any given moment and why they want that thing. And if you know that and you can, can you, you can communicate that to the actor, you'll be okay. Okay, thanks, Jonathan, for sharing your knowledge with us. It's a pleasure having you, of course, in the Universidad de la Sabana in this 17th edition of the Communication Week. Les agradecemos a Jonathan de la New York Film Academy por compartir su conocimiento, a Andrés, por supuesto, que hizo posible este encuentro, y al público, gracias por su asistencia. Y los invitamos a que siguen participando en la decimoséptima semana de la comunicación. Recuerden consultar la agenda y las actividades en nuestras redes sociales en arroba Com Sabana en Instagram y Twitter y Comunicación Sabana en Facebook. Los invitamos a que sigan participando del evento más importante de la facultad y adicionalmente quiero invitarlos a todos para que a las 10 y cuarto se conecten porque tenemos la charla Hagan sus apuestas, así será el periodismo del futuro. Bueno, esto ha sido todo por hoy, entonces nos vemos a las 10 y cuarto. Gracias, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. Gracias, Andrés. Thanks, thanks for having me. I'll see you at the 18th in person. <laughs> yes. Of course. All right. Take care.